Let's talk about narcissists. What happens with narcissists is that we become physiologically addicted to them. And that's what causes that trauma bond. You're looking for that high again. Please welcome Rebecca Zung. Rebecca Zung, how are you? She is recognized as a top 1% attorney in the nation. She's the best-selling author of multiple books. What you likely are familiar with her for is her incredible work on dealing with narcissists. Narcissists don't attach themselves to you because you have so little value. They attach themselves to you because you have so much. Would you say that what is true is that narcissists are drawn to people who don't fully know their own value? A hundred percent. One of the things that is so, so important that people need to understand when they go to communicate or negotiate with narcissists. And that is, that's like kryptonite to them. Rebecca, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. You are amazing. I mean, I so much gratitude for you. So thank you. I, 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 you know, it's so crazy how our paths continue to intertwine uh, many times. Yeah. Yeah. The universe seems to think that we have uh, some, something to offer each other or that at least the pairing of us seems to have something to offer someone else. So um, it's fun. It's been fun cr crisscrossing back and forth our paths. Um, we actually did an interview on your show. I don't remember when we recorded it, but I know it was released just recently. So um, for anybody, if you're if you're a fan of mine and you want a good excuse to go check out Rebecca's channel, you can go watch her interview me on her channel. Um, although I suspect that, like myself, you will immediately get sucked into the vortex of dealing with narcissists. I I feel like that's just probably where we should start. Um, and maybe you could talk about. I mean, you can start wherever you want, Rebecca. I know the audience is going to want to hear your story. You have an incredible story. You've overcome a lot. Um, but I th I'm sure everybody would love to know, like, what's up with this narcissist thing? What, wh when, why, where, and how did you declare war on everybody's secret nemesis, which are narcissistic vampires in their lives, but that most people don't tackle as publicly as you have? How, how did this all happen? Well, you know, first of all, I kind of don't say I declare war, but... <clears throat> I, I I would say that, it, you know, it, it kind of came to my consciousness about four years ago when I had a narcissistic business partner. And it, mm. it, and it, it I really want to make sure that people know that it was only a few years ago for me because it was after I had built a very, very highly successful law practice, very highly successful, representing household names, names you would know. And I was very happy in my life. And, you know, I, I want people to know this because narcissists don't attach themselves to you because you have so little value. They attach themselves to you because you have so much. And they also are able to tear you down in such a fashion that you don't even know what has happened to you. And so all of a sudden I was experiencing trauma and having flashbacks of trauma that I thought that I had long dealt with and was feeling the effects of when I had been bullied as a child. And I had been bullied as a kid for being Asian and you know, and I just remember starting to feel again so disempowered and so uh, isolated and so uh, voiceless. And I, I just remember sitting on the playground as a kid in elementary school feeling voiceless. And, and, I just thought, and here I was just a few years ago, thinking, how the hell did this happen to me? How the hell did this happen to me? And I think that that is all part of God's plan. I do feel that I was chosen, you know, to be a voice on behalf of 
the voiceless. You know, I, I think that it's, it, I'm just the vessel for this because I think, you know, in retrospect, I, I've, my whole life has been preparing me for this time in my life, truly. Having been an attorney, having been bullied as a child, having the experience in media that I'd had, you know, over the years. And I, I just feel so passionately about advocating on behalf of people who feel voiceless in toxic situations, in, in situations where they feel disempowered. So, so I want to, I want to state sort of for the audience that, you know, this is where my head is at. The audience knows I, I, I tend to wing it, right? Like I don't pre-plan these interviews or pre-list my questions or anything that the spirit always calls me, so to speak, in, in what the direction is supposed to be. And right now what I'm juggling in my mind is, do we lean into Rebecca's amazing story that even, even just the little bit that you just shared goes right to what I'm so all about and what I believe is true for all of the audience too, which is that there's this, this through line of your life that ultimately is instructive of and, and orienting toward your actual purpose or your calling on this earth. What, and, it, and it does go back to when you were a kid, right? It's the pairing of your entire life experience coupled with your natural gifts. We call it our success DNA at, at Entra and my, my education platform. So there's that, that story on the one hand, which I, I want to lean into as well. But then there's also like the actual content around narcissists, because I'm thinking so much of the audience probably has narcissists in their lives. And they're probably like, Wait, you know, on the edge of their seat right now for like strategies on how to deal with it. So I'm just going to declare that my attempt in the next 35 minutes is going to be to do a good job of both. Um, and and maybe we can start with uh, what I just started by saying about your story. And I'd like to hear you kind of construct and 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 I'm going to go ahead go ahead and plant this seed in the audience of like as Rebecca is constructing this, I I think it's so valuable for everyone to be thinking about what is my version of, of this, this too, right? Because I think one of the great tragedies in life is that most people aren't living their purpose on a daily basis. And especially there's this divorce for so many people between, no pun intended, between their work life, what they do for a living and their calling or their, per like maybe the things that fulfill them, right? And so I don't think that, I think that doesn't have to be that way. So I would love to hear you take us from bully kid, through successful attorney, through lots that happened in between, through ultimately clarity that this is what you were put on, put on this earth to do. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I was bullied as a kid. I ended up going to boarding school for high school. I sort of found myself there in, in, in a way. I ended up graduating second in my class from high school but, you know, I never really got past that feeling of not feeling worthy, not feeling good enough, not always sort of feeling like I needed to prove myself, feeling like I needed to prove my worth because of that, that feeling, I think, of, of, a, of being a kid. Plus, you know, I, my dad's Asian you know, and my, my, my mom's German, you know, I was, so I always joke that I have no fun genes whatsoever. And I, uh, so, you know, I, I guess I always felt like I needed to prove myself and I, I, my version of rebellion was getting married at 19 and having three kids by the time I was 22. But then even at that point, it was like, okay, what the hell am I doing with my life? So then I ended up I got to prove myself again. So I go back, finish college. I go back to law school. I ended up on law review. I get a job with this, these top family law attorneys. And now I have to prove myself again. I, I got married, you know, out of law school. I met my husband in law school. We've been married for 23 years and we have a child together who's a junior at UC Davis now. But, you know, I ended up Okay, now I have to build the top family law practice in the world. And so I did that and I had all these great clients and it's like this constant feeling of needing to to prove myself, right? 
But then uh, I started shifting. This shift started happening with me a few years ago where I thought, you know, I, I really know that I'm more of an entrepreneur at heart. I don't, I don't enjoy this law practice, even though I'm making a lot of money. I, I, I feel like I'm just a bitch 12 hours a day. That's what I'm doing. I'm a highly paid bitch. That's what I am. And I, I, this is not giving me joy. I don't get to spend any time with my family. It's, I'm trading time for money. I know that I can do better than this. And my husband wanted to spend more time in California. So I merged my practice with two other guys and, you know, we are out in California. And then I ended up in this situation with this person who ended up to be extremely toxic. And, you know, I ended up going back to this business coach of mine right after I got out of that relationship. And well, I'll, I'll tell you two things. I'll tell you a couple of things about that. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that, and it was not even that long of a relationship, that business partnership, but I remember that we, I was on vacation with my husband and my youngest daughter and it was July of 2019. So almost just four years now to the day. Okay. And we went to Maui. We were at the top of the mountain in Haleakala at sunrise. I don't know if you've ever done that. It was so. I've done, I've done that exact. In fact, I did that exactly what you just described in the last six months. It's amazing. <laughs> it is stunningly beautiful. Yeah. Right. Did you do zip line? Did you do zip lining up there? Did you ride a bike? Like, what did you do up there? No, we just, just went to see the sunset. We just went up sunrise. there and seen the sunrise, and it is like okay, okay. heaven on earth, right? Right, right. Heaven yeah. on earth. And my daughter, who was seventeen at the time, she was like, "Oh my gosh, mom, it's heaven on earth." I'm there with my husband and my daughter, like two people I love the most in the world. And what am I thinking of? A freaking narcissist is in my mind, and I had this aha moment. I was like, oh my God, no, 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 no. You do not get to be here with me in heaven on earth. No. And I realized in that moment that every minute I gave that person, I was in victim mode. Like, that's it. I'm done with this. And, and I, the person who walked up that mountain was not the same person who walked down that mountain. Like I was done. And, and so I was like, I have to be in creation mode. And, and so I made a decision. I made a decision. And, and the, the, the root of the word decide is actually side. Did you ever know that? It's actually side to kill, to cut off. And so you cut off any other possibilities. And so I literally walked down that mountain and I was like, I'm getting out of this thing. I'm finishing the book, Negotiate Like You Matter. And I sent it out for endorsements. One of the people I sent it out to was Robert Shapiro. I had never even met the man. He emailed me back right away and said, call me. I called him. He offered to write the foreword for the book, which he did. And... I mean, magic started to happen. At that point, I got out of that relationship. I started studying about narcissism. No, I didn't even know what a narcissist was. And that's when I ended up starting this YouTube channel. Like my whole life changed because of that moment on that mountain. Literally because I decided I was no longer going to be a victim anymore. In that moment, on that mountain. So, you know, one decision can change your life to no longer be a victim. That moment. At that moment, I started on YouTube and, and going into what you were saying is that was when I took off on YouTube and I now have 40 million views on YouTube. And, and I, I, I started my high conflict master high conflict negotiation certification program. I, I just started that like a few weeks ago and I have, um, it's a mixture of online self-directed content and also some live. And I had my very first live with it yesterday. I had 1100 people sign up for that. Wow. Um, when I first 
kicked it off and um, all organically. I didn't even put it out on my social. I only put it out to my list. You know, I have over 200,000 people on my list in, in, in three years, all organically. Like my, it's just insane. My, my, you know, what I've done. And I had my first live yesterday and it's just so the, the idea, like it's just starting to impact me. Like it's actually makes me emotional when I think about this, because it's not just that they started telling me the stories of how I've changed their life. And it's not just their lives it's their kids lives it's the generation it's 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 what's happening because of this is not me this is god is using me as i'm a vessel this is and and you know i'm making money from this but it's not that is not that is not the per like that. That is not my mm -hmm. why. Uh, my whole why has completely shifted. Completely shifted. Yeah. So I know why the universe keeps keeps putting us together. It's because there's so many parallels in what you've described with with what I've experienced too. And I think there's value when people get the same message reinforced from multiple sources. And you know, th this is a. This is, you know, a, a conversation about you, not me. So I'm not going to go into my detailed story. And my audience knows a lot of my story. But but if you think about those, even just some of the highlights, like bullied as a kid, dropped out of the path that we were supposed to be on. You were supposed to be, you know, the good little Asian girl that went to college, I'm sure became a, you know, I don't know, a consultant for McKenzie or whatever your path was supposed to be. I was, you know, I dropped out in high school. You dropped out in college. I became a musician. And you got married and had kids. And then we got back on our path, but it didn't look like the way it would have originally looked. And then we had a bunch of other hardships and, and experiences professionally. And then we had this, this moment when it all came together in a moment of clarity and our why shifted and our mission shifted. And we started, we went from having a career to having a crusade that we never even knew we were going to have. And now we both probably make more money than we ever did before when we thought we had a plan. Like it's, and, and that's, that's why I wanted to go down this path with you of like, I truly believe, and maybe I'm just cray cray, I truly believe that this is possible for every human on earth. Their oh version God. of what we just described, where 100%. all the pieces come together and you have that moment on the top of Haleakala Mountain when your new future becomes clear and you understand all the trials and tribulations that led you to that moment. 100% it's possible for everybody. I just got the chills, by the way. I believe it. it it's and, and I, it's, I mean, I had this conversation um, with about uh, like a few, a couple months ago on the show with a lady named Melissa Urban, who has the Whole30 eating program. And she was sort of like, we started the conversation with her going like, no, 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 I, this, you know, there was no plan. There was no universal contrivance. And then by the end of it, she, she was like looking back going, oh my gosh, I see it now. My whole life led me to do what I'm doing. And it's, I just believe that's true for everyone. And I believe that the greatest tragedy on earth is to get to the end of your life and never have realized what you were supposed to have been doing. And, and I'm not here to say that raising kids isn't great or being, you know, like, I mean, everybody's calling is different, but I, I will challenge the audience to say, make sure you don't settle for somebody else's picture of what a calling is supposed to look like, you know, and, and at least challenge yourself to say, is there something bigger I'm meant for? Because I do see a lot of people say, oh, well, I found my purpose. But then I look at their life through questioning and it's like they're not completely fulfilled. And I know you love word origins. We, we talk about decide. The word fulfillment actually comes from the origin of the original Old English word for prophecy. Mm. You are fulfilled when you fulfill your prophecy. Mm. And so if you're, if you think you found your calling, but you're not completely fulfilled, I challenge you, have you fulfilled your prophecy? Cause if you haven't, then you aren't fulfilled. So anyway, I, uh, I believe you are totally fulfilling your prophecy. Let's talk about narcissists. There's another, um, another thing you've said that I'm like, oh my gosh, Rebecca, and I have so much to talk to Re Rebecca about where you're talking about when you said feeling voiceless, mm -hmm. 
even inside your own business. I don't want to overshare, but I'll say that in the last several years, I had an experience of having actually wasn't even a partner. I, I'm I'm blessed. I have a, a really a, a partner that we work great together, but there was somebody in an organization I was involved in. I don't want to say too much who I'm pretty convinced was a narcissist and that word voiceless. I remember feeling, feeling like, how is it that I am no longer, I no longer have my own voice inside my own business. Mm -hmm. And you're helping me see in reflection that it was, it's validating my suspicion that there was a narcissist at play because a narcissist can't tolerate anybody else having a voice. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. Anyway, this isn't about me. This is about you, but but let's like, like no, I mean, me. I, this is about us having a conversation. This is two friends having a conversation. That's what this is. Well, well I'll just say it was really powerful to realize, like, you just now helped me put a word to something. I'm curious, have you ever read a book called People of the Lie no. by Scott Peck? Oh, no. So he's, his more famous book is called The Road Less Traveled, which is yeah, like yeah, a very, course. very well known psychology book. But my favorite book of his is called People of the Lie. Interesting. And it is it is an explorate a scientific writing it you down. know slash medical exploration of human evil. I think you're going to love this book and the audience. You guys, I mean, this is one of the most in influential books in my life. Where he says, "Hey, if we're really going to understand evil and and potentially develop treatments or like methodologies for dealing with evil." We have to stop moralizing about it. As soon as a conversation becomes moral, it is no longer empirical. It is no longer scientific. And in the sense of, of remediation, it's no longer terribly constructive. Mm. So he took his background as a uh, a trained, as a, a, a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, and said, I'm going to explore the question of human evil as a medical and scientific question. Mm. And he used a lot of studies, examples from his practice, but the ultimate, I don't want to give away the ending, but I feel like I kind of need to, to get to my point here for why I brought it up. His ultimate distillation of human evil is it is the combination of narcissism and laziness. That those are actually the two foundational pillars of, of all evil itself is self-love, i.e. narcissism and avoidance of pain, i.e. laziness. Mm. I'm curious your take on that. Well, I mean, you can characterize it as evil. You can characterize it however you want to. But I mean, the bottom line is that narcissism is a it, it, it's a trauma. It's it's a result of trauma mm -hmm. that has not been processed by humans. And, you know, it's deep shame. And it it causes people to treat other people in a way that is not okay. And they, you know, um, I, I recently heard that, the, you know, trauma characterized in a really interesting way. It's like your trauma can cause you to choose things. Your trauma can cause you to choose people. Your trauma, your trauma causes you to, um, uh, be self-destructive, you know, your, your trauma, you know, shows up in all sorts of ways and it's, it's their trauma. You're interact, you're at, you're interacting with other people's trauma. Your trauma is causing, you know, it's, it's almost like a, a it's like you and then the other person. And then there's like, two other people in a, in a, in a, in an interaction, their trauma and your trauma, you know, right. it's, it's, a, it's kind of an interesting way to think about it, you know? And so, you know, you can call it evil, but that's what you want to do, but it's really trauma is what you're talking about. Well, well, so I think, I think what, you know, Peck is saying, and, and we don't have to, you know, dwell on Peck's thesis too much, but basically is, I, I think he agrees with you, although he doesn't really get into the, the origination of it from a trauma perspective, but it's that avoidance of, of properly processing and dealing with trauma. hundred percent. Is the, is the, is another, frankly, in one sense, another term for laziness. It's and they're not going the, to. Yeah. It's taking the lazy path out from trauma, which is to avoid it, escape it, deflect from it, not deal with it, 
no matter how much damage you end up doing to other people because of it. I always say, you know, it's it's projection and deflection and lying and denying, lying and denying. You know, they're never they're never going to be self-aware. They're never going to be self-aware and and because of their deep shame and, and all of that. And one of the things that I learned in my research for my book is how narcissism comes about. And that is, which is one of the things that is so, so important that people need to understand when they go to communicate or negotiate with narcissists. And that is understanding actually the physiology of a narcissist's brain. And that is that when you are dealing with trauma as a human being, the way we react is this fight or flight response, right? And when that happens, our brains emit chemicals, hormones, adrenaline and cortisol, things like that, right? As children, when that happens on a continuous basis, it actually causes damage to the limbic system, the emotional center of the brain. And so that center, that limbic system, part of the brain actually experiences arrested development. And so when narcissists are then, you know, they grow into adults while the prefrontal cortex of the brain might continue to develop the thinking part of the brain, that limbic system, that emotional center of the brain does not. And so when they're presented with stimuli in their environment as adults that causes them to feel like they are threatened in some way, whether we think it's rational or not, most of the time we don't, they do, then they respond in a way that is completely irrational. So it's called narcissistic injury. And that when that narcissistic injury gets triggered, that, that part of their brain is immediately activated. And then they, you know, react. And, and many times it's, it comes out in what, what is called narcissistic rage. And when that part of the brain is activated, sometimes they don't even remember what they did or said during that period of time. And so, and not only that, by the way, not only that, by the way, they will take themselves down to take you down. They will take themselves down to take you down. So well, when you go to sit down to negotiate with a person like that, a normal, regular, reasonable person says, hey, how can we come to a resolution? How can we, you know, how could you provide, you know, be, be you know, get the value that you want to see? You know, how can I get what I want to see? How can we come to a resolution? What looks reasonable? You know, you don't want to spend a lot on attorneys. Neither do I. You know, what looks... That they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about how can I manipulate you? How can I make you squirm? How can I make your life miserable? How can I continue to game play? So I'm curious, in retrospect, I mean, because you used to do the legal work for divorces. Right. Uh, and from what I know of your practice, it was a lot of like, you, you know, you, you had a higher end clientele, a lot of successful, wealthy, affluent people. And I'm curious, did you, in hindsight, were you dealing with a lot of narcissists? Oh, in hindsight, in yes. Yes. In hindsight, okay. yes. So narcissists are driven by one thing and one thing only, and that's narcissistic supply. You know, regular reasonable people are motivated and incentivized by a lot of different things. You know, it could be you know, your children or doing a good thing or you know, it's a lot of different things, but they're only driven by this emptiness, this void that they feel inside of them. It's like pain. You know, it's like if you have a toothache or something, all you can think about is your pain, yourself. That's why they don't have any empathy for anybody else, because all they think about is this. They, and it can never be filled, this emptiness they have inside of them. But this need for narcissistic supply 
what I figured out, there's two different tiers of it. So there's diamond level supply, what I call diamond level supply, which is how they look to the world, which is the big houses, the big job, the impressive friends, lots of money, that sort of thing, the, the, what I call the window dressing. Then there's the what I call the dark underbelly of narcissistic supply or coal level supply, which is degrading people, controlling people, manipulating people, making them squirm, pushing themselves up, bolstering themselves up by pushing other people down. And, and they also love that form of supply too. So there's two different tiers of it. They will do everything they can to hold on to both forms of supply, but they will protect and defend their diamond level supply with their life more than anything. So when you go to negotiate with them, the key is to figure out what form of supply they're going to be willing to keep in order to and 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 threaten that form of supply so that you know you can somehow get them to let go of the supply that they get from jerking you around but you can't actually expose them because if you do then your leverage is gone. Gotcha. So essentially what I'm hearing you say is a narcissist wants, a, they want a reputation and they want victims, but it's harder to rebuild a reputation than it is to find a new victim. So if they have to lose one, they'll lose a victim. They'll, they'll die on the hill of their, their reputation. Correct. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's so interesting. Um Oh gosh, I'm having like so much clarity about, like I said, some stuff that I dealt with in the last in the last five years. But um, yeah, that's why they constantly move goalposts. That's why they'll send over a proposal to settle uh, something, and then you'll you'll think about it for three days or whatever, and then you'll go back and you'll say, okay, yes, I'll take it. And then by the time you go back, they say, yeah, you know what? Never mind that deals off the table now because you took too long because I don't like your hair anymore. Um, because you know, you have brown eyebrows, you know, whatever. <laughs> Cause they're, and they're just, they're just reinforcing their own power to themselves. Like, Correct. In that. Exactly. So, so I'm curious, um, do, do you feel like you dealt with a disproportionate number of narcissists in that part of your life, that career, uh, relative to the larger population? And if yes, is it because more affluent people tend to be narcissists? Or is it because more affluent people who get divorced tend to be narcissists? Or was the answer no, and actually there's narcissists at all rungs? Because I guess what I'm connecting a dot in my mind is narcissism does seem like one basis for for high, amb high levels of ambition to become really successful, because that's that diamond supply. I mean, certainly it, it's one of those uh, rungs. I, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I would say here's one of the things that I did come to that. I, it's hard for me to say that. I mean, definitely, I, I would say they probably don't stay married as much. But one of the things that I definitely did find interesting is that roughly 15 percent of the population either has narcissism or has a personality disorder that lacks empathy, meaning they have antisocial personality disorder or bipolar personality disorder or some other personality disorder that lacks empathy. Now, when I was practicing law, we would settle approximately 85% of our cases in mediation. Approximately 15% of the cases would never settle no matter what the hell you would do. They always proceeded to trial because there was one side that just was ridiculous and there was nothing you could do about it. And in retrospect, that there was always at least a narcissist on one side or the other, or both. Uh, that is That is so interesting. Okay, so... Uh, question that comes to mind, um, you and I were both bullied as kids. We both had 
chronic trauma that persisted over years. Why? Uh, and, and actually, I have my own thoughts on this that I could, you know, perhaps share. Um, I, I actually feel like oh, and so I'll, I'll say this actually, and maybe maybe there's risk in saying this. I feel like my trauma. There were times in my life when I think I could have been at risk of becoming a narcissist, or maybe even displaying some of those tendencies because I just purely because of trauma. But I can definitely say, I think at this point in my life, and I actually asked my therapist once point blank, I said, em, do you think there's any chance that I'm a narcissist? And he um, told me, no, he's like, like, trust me, there's a lot that you do and a lot of ways that you operate that are not that. Um, but I could see, like, I could almost see how like in that pain and in that shame and in that avoidance of processing it healthily in a way that brings you back into connection and empathy and all that, you know, accesses those capacities, like I almost get it at risk of saying that. And so I'm curious, why aren't you and I narcissists? We both had trauma. Well, I think that everybody has, it, it, it is a spectrum. I mean, it's definitely a spectrum. And I, I actually asked my therapist the same question, to be honest with you. And I think that we all have moments of it, you know? I, but I think that there are times that people are feeling more narcissistic than others. Like if you're sick, if you're stressed, if you are, but you know, it's, it's when you are further, further, further down on the spectrum and you're just not willing to be self-aware, you're not willing to change. You're not willing to go to therapy. You're not willing to do the work. You're not willing to do the excavation and, and be exposed. You're not willing to say, Hey, I don't like this about myself and I don't want to be like this. You know, I mean, it, it takes, it's hard it's hard to look at the shameful parts of yourself and the stuff that you don't want to look at. It's hard to sit there and say, hey, I was bullied as a kid. And, you know, vulnerability is hard for somebody when you're a narcissist. You know, that that's the hard work of it. But what narcissists don't understand is that there's so much power in being vulnerable. It's there's so much more power and there's so much more authenticity in and connection in, in being that real person, but they, they're not willing to do that. They're so fear-based. They're so scarcity based. So, so the arrested development in the limbic brain, which I love that, that, that visual, I mean, as a, as a psychology dilettante, I'm very into the functioning of the limbic brain. And so I'm, I'm picturing like a compromised hippocampus, which would be to say, I cannot store emotional memories. Therefore experiencing an emotion leaves no trace. Therefore it doesn't inform my future actions. Like I can kind of connect these pieces. It's so interesting, but, um, it does it does. So are you, am I hearing you say that there is a capacity to regrow or to let's say to grow that missing tissue so to speak if a narcissist is willing to do that hard work at some point in their life or is there a point of no return where it's like so far gone and you've dug yourself so deep that no amount of therapy or desire to change or reflection or whatever can get you out of the fact that you're basically you're now just a, an old narcissist that can't learn new tricks you know i don't know the answer to that question i mean i've actually spoken to some psychologists who think that maybe psychedelics might be able to help or something like that, something, some mind expanding things that could potentially help. I think it would take a tremendous amount of work on their part. But, you know, the, the, this, the first step, of course, would be to say, I need help. I want to, I'm willing to be vulnerable. I want to be self-aware which is the fundamental problem when you're a narcissist. They're not willing to do that. Um, yeah, it, I feel like I wonder if if some kind of spiritual reckoning is part of it. I mean, obviously, in, in, the, in the myth, in the Greek myth of Narcissus, I mean, he was so enamored with his reflection that the gods turned him into a flower because they were actually furious that he loved his reflection more than he loved the gods. 
And yeah. I'm not I'm not a subscriber to the Mount Olympus narrative, but I wonder well, I, if there's I, not some some truth in that, right? That humility of like, in order for me to let go of be or to to outgrow this narcissist narcissism, I have to sort of surrender to something greater than myself. Exactly. I mean, I actually put that story in my book too. I. I think that some narcissists do if they hit bottom, if they're completely collapsed. You know, they I've have spoken to a few that have said I used to be a narcissist, you know, but then I lost my business. My wife left me. I had nothing. I ended up penniless. I was on the floor, you know, and and I maybe, you know, when that happens. Sure. It's, it's interesting. You described it as a spectrum. Um, I'm what it seems to almost parallel like addiction in a lot of ways. I uh, and I think that addicts are narcissists. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and and especially in the sense that like nobody doesn't have any addictive tendencies. Like all people, you know, if you put a chocolate cookie in front of them or a, a radish, there's some physiological response to the presentation of sugar that you could say is like a very small precursor to an addictive choice or an addictive behavior. I mean, like we're it's 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 in all of us to some degree. And it, I, I like the way you describe this, that the same is true of narcissism. Like we all have pain. We all want to avoid the pain. We all have shame. We all have trauma. And to some degree, narcissism is almost just like a permanent commitment to the avoidance of those things. hundred percent. And the brain is wired for survival. It's not wired for success. And we have to, for all of us, in order to become successful, we have to rewire the neuronal pathways it, you know, that's the work of it. That's the work of it. And isn't it interesting? I feel like you and I, maybe I'm reaching here to connect these things, but you and I both experienced a whole other level of professional success when we were frankly, both already professionally successful. When we would, when I would say we made the even less narcissistic choice, I'm not suggesting either of us were successful narcissists before, but e the even less narcissistic choice to basically pivot our careers totally in the direction of service. 100%. And care about, and care about others rather than ourselves. 100%. And by the way, and we both and I'm going to I'm going to contextualize your success cuz my audience knows me. So, you said you launched your YouTube channel in July of 2019? Um yeah, in the fall fall of 2019. Okay. Yeah. Mhm. Mm or you had your you had your epiphany in, in July and a few months later you took action. Uh, I actually, interestingly, Entra sold its first course in July of 2019, July 21st. So so my my Mount Haleakala moment was actually about 10 months prior in September. I was on a long run training for a marathon. I think I was at mile 12 or something. And I had this epiphany of like, what if I just start giving away free content to teach people how to, you know, make a career change and start an online business. And that, that kind of grew into Entra. But anyway, um, I guess my, my point in saying all that is, oh yeah, to contextualize your success. So we both started doing this about the same time. Interestingly, like let's say 20, 2018, 2019, I have uh, almost 90,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel. And I've had about four and a half million views on my YouTube channel. And I've also spent not not on myself, but as the uh, on Entra on promotion of Entra with me as the face and the call it the pitch man, um, probably sixty million dollars in online ads since then. So that's I mean I've essentially bought billions of impressions in the marketplace again for Entra not for me but with me as the face and it's created the recognition and the spillover that's helped me grow my brand. So I'm saying all that to to say. $60 million, five years, hundreds of videos. I've got 90,000 subs and four and a half million views. You haven't spent a dime no. to promote yourself. And you've got basically 10X. Well, let's say- I have 40, 40 million views, almost 400,000 subscribers. Yeah. That is, a, that is a bananas growth story for five years of purely organic value on YouTube. I mean, if anybody's wondering like, how valuable is this lady's content? Let the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, that's crazy. Congratulations, by the way. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I just, it's about the impact for me. Hey there, real quick. I just wanted to let you know, I have been concentrating a lot lately on providing tons of value to my text message community. This could be 
random thoughts. This could be letting you be the first to know about an event I'm planning or a special I'm running or a free training I'm hosting. Anyway, just shoot me a text to get subscribed. The number is 702-996-3926. Thanks so much. Let's get back to the podcast. Can you maybe share any sort of case studies or, or success stories from your work that you're particularly proud of in terms of the impact you've had for people? Oh, gosh. There are so many. I mean, just last night, I was on this call with my very first training live for my master high conflict negotiation coaches. And there were probably, I don't know, 40 on the call. And I'm doing them in groups, you know. And I mean, the stories of these people who have been impacted by my work and now they want to become coaches because of that. And, you know, it's a, it's a $5,000 program that they, they, they're, they've purchased. And I mean, on and on and on. One of them was a, a guy who had heard me is a, a businessman who, you know, was in a, a custody situation with this woman who he, he said, you know, they, they had a, a kind of a casual relationship. And then, you know, she turned up pregnant. And then two weeks later, he, she was a dead, he, he became a deadbeat dad. And he was a, a massive custody battle with this woman. And all of a sudden, um, with but by the time she, the child was six months old, she accused him of being a uh, abusive father, abusing the child, and it was awful. And then he found me on YouTube. He ended up buying my sleigh program. He he used everything that I taught him. By the time the child was, I think, eighteen months, by using my tactics, he got fifty percent custody. And by using my tactics in June, he ended up with 100% custody uh, of his child. And he, you know, owes it all to me. Um, there was another woman in the room last night who said that she had narcissistic parents and then married a narcissist and ended up in some sort of a facility, residential facility, because she tried to commit suicide. She wanted to die, um, found my content, ended up using the SLAY program. Uh, she was, you know, uh, uh, credited me with saving her life. She was literally sobbing. Um, now she wants to help others do the same thing. Um, and she knows that she can be an inspiration the same way that I was for her. Um, there was another woman on there who has this high uh, profile husband who is, you know, somebody who's so high profile that, you know, she was almost like wearing a mask on the thing. But um you know, he she she ended up with a brain tumor, and he basically tried to discard her, and she ended up trying to take care of herself th throughout the whole situation. And so, as soon as she was able to get through that, I mean, she found me, she used my program, she ended up getting out of that relationship. Now she is fully empowered and wants to become a high conflict coach herself. I mean, the stories are like. On and on it's, and on and on. It's it's really amazing in a horrifying way. I, I can only imagine the amount of just carnage that you're witness to from what these people do to do to people. It's it's crazy. So um, 
maybe the uh, the preventative portion of the interview is like based on your experience, based on hearing these stories. I'm curious, do you have any sort of like early detection guidance for people of how to how to steer clear, how to how to know that you might be in proximity to a narcissist and stay out of their their radius, maybe? I, I mean, I can tell you from it, it, it's the professionally and personally, you know, because I dealt with it in a professional setting. And, you know, the way they come on is they're extremely charming. They're extremely because they use mirror neurons. So they actually become perfect for you. They know mm -hmm. how to read people. They it's a survival technique that they developed very young so they and and it, it it's they're like in your face so much at the beginning of the relationship that you're like wow where has this person been all my life and they're sweeping you off your feet and you know it's like we're soulmates and you know and this is professionally or personally so you know, and they want to get to that next level to lock you in as fast as possible. So it's, you know, we should work together. We should be business partners. You should hire me, you know, whatever it is, or we should be moving in together. We should get married. We should go to Vegas. You know, how can we be locked in as fast as possible? I want to meet your family you know, why wait? Why wait? We have, should have been met, met long ago. And, you know, in my situation, I, you know, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to be, you know, backlash, but, you know, it was something that I had already had. And this person came along and said, I have all these skills and I can make it better for you and blah, blah, blah. Right. So they just m position themselves in this way that they just m worm their way into you. And when you see red flags, which you do even at the beginning, they don't allow you to see them. They bat them away. So if you start start to say, well, maybe we should slow down or maybe we should. Oh, why? You know, they have explanations for everything. Or even if you see, you know, something like that's not adding up, you have an explanation at the ready, at the ready, at the ready. And, and so you, you don't have a chance to think. You don't have a chance to breathe at the beginning until they lock you in. And then almost immediately it changes almost right away because they can't, it's almost like they're holding their breath. And then as soon as they lock, lock you in, they, oh, they can breathe because they, they're making deposits and they want to get to the withdrawal stage as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it, you, when you were describing that, it perfectly matched with something I read the other day that was like the four stages of emotional abuse. And stage one was flattery. Mm -hmm. Stage two was isolation, yeah. which is like, like you're describing, like, we got to go into business together. We got to move in together. It's, it's, it's about getting them more in, getting you more into their world and more out of the world you were in before them. Right. Right. It's like, it's like locking it down. And then it goes to, uh, aggression. And then I think stage four was ultimately indifferent contempt, which is like, if they're not getting what they, if they're not, if their supply to use your term is not. Uh, full, if they're not feeling sufficiently supplied, then eventually they just start to disregard you and ignore you and hold, can hold you in contempt, basically. Right, right. So the, the next level is, you know, where it's, why are you texting me so much? And, you know, or they ghost you, they, they just stop, you know, it's because they start or they, off. They by, gas, gaslight, I think gaslighting was mentioned too. They, oh, they course, start to you to make you think you're crazy. Yeah. Of course, gaslighting is in there. You know, because it's you go from 50,000 texts a day to, oh, my gosh, you're so needy. Why are you texting me 50,000 times a day? I have other things I need to do. Now, all of a sudden, you're not hearing from them at all. Right. So so in terms of early detection, 
you know, again, the thing I read was four stages of emotional abuse, but it sounds like it pretty closely mirrors four stages of relational narcissism. So would would flattery and isolation be kind of the first early warning signs that like they, you said they sweep you off your feet, they ingratiate themselves, and then they start to like move you into their world. That's, is that a consistent formula? Right. It's hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. And, and it's interestingly enough, there's a study done by a, a guy named Robert Sapolsky out of Stanford. And he talks about what happens when in the brain with monkeys when they are given a reward for doing something good. And when they were given a reward for doing something good every single time where they knew when they were going to get it, nothing happened in their brain. But if they were given a reward intermittently where they didn't know that when they were going to get it, the just the anticipation that they might get it caused the dopamine levels in their brain to rise to the level of cocaine. So what happens with narcissists is because of this hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, is not only do we have, you know, this problem with them, but this push, pull, push, pull, push, pull with them is that we become physiologically addicted to them as well. And that's what causes that trauma bond because you're, you're mm -hmm. looking for that high again. Come on, where's that high? Where's that person who was going to be so perfect? Where is that? So I'm curious, has this work in any way made you mistrustful of people from the standpoint of like, if people are too flattering or if people are trying to move too fast in any scenario, you like your, your radar goes up. And with that, or do you, so, I guess the, the corollary would be like, or do some, sometimes are there other explanations for that behavior where you can't immediately say, oh, that's narcissism. Um, and then the second question is to, is actually give you space to talk about your book. Cause I know that's coming out soon and uh, the world needs to read it. So. Thank you. I, I, I would say, say mistrustful. I would just say more aware. I just say, I defend my light with my life and I have now made a very conscious decision to attract people into my life that are vibrating at a higher level. And I, you know, I got, I was very, very fortunate to get to interview Gary Zukoff. Do you know who he is? Mm -hmm. um, he wrote the book, The Seat of the Soul, which was it's an amazing book. He's a quantum physicist who uh, he was actually on Oprah Winfrey's uh, it, that Oprah always says it's her favorite book of all time. And she she said it was the book that influenced her the most. And she I, she had him on her show, like, I think, 40 times or something like that. And brilliant, brilliant man. And I, uh I just I just bought it while you're oh, talking. I just I just bought it. the audio book. Okay, cool. Yeah, you will love it. So brilliant, this guy. And he he talked. I actually asked him this question because I I, I was so curious about this. That you know, that I think that people, you know, can only be in your space if they're vibrating at your level, and that's why I think that. Sometimes people just happen to naturally evolve out of your space because radio waves cannot travel with light waves, you know, because they're just not there anymore. Uh. And so I asked him that question. I said, is, is that true? Does that happen? And he actually confirmed that for me, um, which you can watch that interview on my YouTube uh. channel too. I, I heard something. I just want to say I heard something the other day, which is it's really hard for butterflies to talk to caterpillars. Yeah. yeah. Which makes me make, you know, what you're saying made me think of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, you can't join hands if you're um, if traveling at a much lower um, mm -hmm. uh, vibrational level. So 
I, I think that if you're vibrating at a certain level, that those people who are vibrating at a lower level just naturally are not going to be in your space anyway. And, mm -hmm. and it, you just think of it in terms of n not from a judgment point of view. Right, right. It's not, if you're not superior, you're just separate, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, and, you know, so I always say you wish them well, but over there. <laughs> what, what, I'm curious. Okay. So for someone who is where you are on this journey of both six, because, because it's interesting is there's an element to what you're describing that's embedded in, in just purely into success, right? Where like, as you become more successful and some of it's financial, but some of it's reputational, some of it's social capital, brand equity, like all these things, these things that come with it, there is a sense of like, okay, I need to be more protective of what I'm building. And a lot of that is who's in my life. So I'm curious, you know, coupled with the natural arc of success, plus your very specific and specialized work around narcissism and like energy frequencies and stuff, what percentage of people that you come across do you feel like let's maybe this isn't the right term, but qualify to get to stay in your field? And I don't mean to put you on the spot and make you sound like like snooty, but it's like I, I just sort of have to imagine that there, you've kind of reached a point where like a lot of people just don't make the cut. I don't know. I've not really thought about it in terms of like percentages or anything like that. I don't know. I, I I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I'm so fortunate to just get to meet really, really great people nowadays. You know, I mean, I, I got to, you know, go spend a day with Lisa Bilyeu the other day. And, yeah. and she and I really, really hit it off. And we were, uh, you know, becoming friends and we were just talking about it and it, it was just very, very natural. And I, I just felt like I, I, you know, I just, it just felt very natural. And I just, I, you know, I didn't feel like, Oh, you know, what am I doing here? And I didn't feel like an imposter or anything like that. And I just feel like if, um, I think that, you know, people will think what you tell them to think. And, right. uh, you know, that, that one of my favorite stories is that, I don't know if I've ever told you this story before, but when I, I had been practicing law for like eight years and then I left and I was a wealth advisor at Morgan Stanley. I had my series seven and 66 for like two years. And then I went back to being a lawyer when I started my practice because I had a friend who was like leaving town and she had like 12 clients and she was like, I'm leaving town. If you want to start a practice, here's my clients. And I was like, okay, nobody's ever dropping a law practice in my lap ever. So I'm going to take these clients and start a practice. And then I, I said to my business coach, I said, oh, people of Naples, Florida are going to think I'm such a flake. She was a lawyer and then she was a wealth advisor back to being a lawyer. And I was so nervous that people were going to think I was such a flake. And she said, people will think what you tell them to think. She said, you can tell them to think that you're a flake or you can tell them to think that you are the only lawyer in town that has a wealth background. So maybe you're more qualified than any other family law attorney in town. What story would you like to tell? And I said, oh, maybe I'll tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so that's the story that I chose to tell. And within two years, I had the largest family law practice in town. And I was representing Arnold Schwarzenegger's goddaughter. And I got, got to travel with Arnold in Spain and go to his, you know, um, his sports festival over there with him. And, you know, I, I, I got to do really, really super cool things because I decided, you know, people will think what you tell them to think. And clearly, you know, I got to do things with clients that, you know, pe people hired me that clearly, you know, weren't going to hire a flake. Right. But, you know, people will think what you tell them to think. Well, I love, I feel like you answered the question, the original question about the percentages in a really elegant way, which is that like, 
if you're clear enough about your intention, you're clear enough about the story you tell, you're clear enough about the 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 energy that you put out there. There's the it's a big enough world that you can create a world that's filled with a hundred percent of people that resonate in your space. And it doesn't really matter what the larger percentage of the world is. If you're clear enough on who you are, you can construct a world in which everybody fits. And the people that don't fit, like you said, they just won't be there. Um, and the percentage doesn't really matter because it's all relative. Um, the book. Tell us about the book. I know it's coming out, I think, in October. I don't know exactly when this October, will be released. It'll either be yeah. really, go ahead. October 3rd, yeah. Okay, so this will either be right before that or right after that. Either way, new book coming out. Super exciting. Tell us about it. Yes. Uh, Slay the Bully, How to Negotiate with a Narcissist and Win. I'm so excited about this because it has everything you need in it. It talks about how to negotiate with a narcissist. It gives you practical tips, even if you're actually not negotiating. If you want to actually just communicate, you want to deal with, you want scripts, you want day-to-day resources, tips, tricks, and anything you need, whether it's a professional setting, a personal setting you're dealing with, family member, a neighbor, whoever it is that you need to deal with in your life, this is the practical guide that you need for dealing with it. There's nothing else like this out there ever that's been written. And, you know, somebody, an actual attorney who understands the psyche of dealing with narcissists and I'm really, really excited about this book. So go to slaythebully.com and grab it. Well, I know it's going to be a hit. I mean, just the growth of your channel and the growth of your your business outside of the practice of law. You know, when I said earlier that you had declared war, I, 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 I take your point that it wasn't an open declaration. But the point is, you've tapped into something that is clearly an enormous challenge that that real people are dealing with in their lives and like you just as you just alluded to i don't know anybody else that has so overtly taken this challenge on and, and has frankly the credentials to to approach it the way you have um so congratulations just from an entrepreneurial perspective on finding a ridiculously opportune white space and you know engineering yourself into it i mean it's just incredible when people find these waves and they can ride them like you are Thank you. Thank you. I, I very much appreciate it. And I very much appreciate you. So much gratitude. Well, I can't uh, I can't wait to, to get my hands on the book. I'm fortunate that I don't think at this point I'm dealing with any uh, highly active narcissists in my life, but you never know. And, and I will say anything around uh, navigating difficult conversations or difficult personalities. I mean, that's that's the superpower skill set in this world. Right. hundred um, percent. So I'm, I'm excited to get my hands on it. Uh, audience, make sure you check it out. We'll put a link uh, to it in the show notes um, and I'll, I'll uh, send out a link as well if, if depending on when this gets released. Rebecca, any uh, final thoughts or words before we wrap? I just remember that, you know, you and you alone define your value and people will think what you tell them to think. You know, that those are the main things, 100% of winning anything is your mindset. You know, you you can do anything if you have the right mindset. They only win if you give in. So that that is, is it, absolutely the the message. Is it true? Would you say it's true that narcissists you said earlier, narcissists are not drawn to people who have no value. Would you say that what is true is that narcissists are drawn to people who don't fully know their own value? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, and you know, they they find that one weakness. They find they they find that that place where they can kind of swoop in there. And I'm telling you, when you know who you are, your authentic power, and you stand in that power, that authentic power beats their counterfeit power every single time that's like kryptonite to them they will move on to the next person believe me believe me i love that so if you have a narcissist in your life you're hearing it right here it's not because you have no value it's because they're more aware of your value than you may be um rebecca thanks for being on the show this has been great thank you thank you so much really 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 appreciate you 
Of course. And to all you viewers and listeners out there, I tell you every time you're the best part of the show. You're why I do what I do every single day. So grateful we got to spend this time together and I'll see you on the next one. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. Pleasure and pain work like opposite sides of a balance. When we experience pleasure, the way that our brains get us back to the level position is first by tipping to the side of pain. As we become addicted, we are compulsively pursuing our drug in the total absence of joy.